My mother's first film for Ealing was in 1938, and uh, that was just as Michael Borkham was coming in, I think. it was, uh, But it was the time when Basil Dean was really running the show because a lot of George Formby films. And uh, my mother was in one. It was directed by Anthony Kimmins. And uh, so it, it, she had done a string of films before that, really 20 or so films under her belt. But they were all quota quickies, and they were done out at Ealing. And it was a time when Mummy was really playing sort of ditzy blondes. And she was just, she was dark haired originally, you know, and she was playing sort of fun, sort of girls in the Lady Vanishes for Hitchcock. She's still sort of a blonde, fun, loving young thing. Uh, but later on, after after uh, Trouble Brewing, when she came back to Ealing, um, she was in a, a film that had been taken from a play. And the play was by J.P.B. Priestley, and it was called They Came to a City. And um, somehow they thought it would be good to film it. It was a very strange piece. It was about sort of utopia. It was very um, sort of labor, left wing. And uh, they thought that it would catch at that particular moment a time when after the war people were looking towards this sort of thing. But it didn't really work on film. But it worked for my mother very well, uh, because really from then on, she played far more dramatic parts. And um, coming back and doing Pink Strings and Ceiling Wax, for instance, was a wonderful part for her. She adored it. But before that, she did Dead of Night. And that was a, um, it was a sort of portmanteau of lots and lots of different directors coming together and making different little horror stories. And my mother's particular story that she was involved in was about a haunted mirror. Peter, it's the mirror. Mr. Rutherford, tell me about it. That's why I came back. It belonged to a man who was crippled who accused his wife just as you're now accusing me. Peter, you must listen to me. And that was directed by Robert Hayman. It was his first piece of direction. Uh, he'd been an editor before that. And so then we come to Pink Strings and Ceiling Wax. Hello, Dan. Oh, hello, Pearl. What are you doing out here? Just came out for a breath of fresh air. Joe, see you come out? He's too drunk to see anything. Anyone else see you? Her? Much I care whether she did or not. Get down, May, will you? I'm late. Where are you going? Inside. Louise will be waiting. Louise. She's all right, Louise is. She's a fool. Go on, I'm a fool too. Both of us making fools of ourselves over a dirty, cheating swine. I know she loved the costumes. And they are great, sort of Victorian bustles and things, and terribly flattering. Um, and she liked the meatiness. She liked, you know, it's great fun when you're playing the villainess and the murderous, adulterous, <laughs> flirty, um, and yet then frightened. What do you have? Penneth. What's yours? I'm not drinking with you. Please yourself. Why can't you stick to your own man instead of running after mine? Hark at her. Yours indeed. Seems to me the only thing you ever got out of Dan was that pretty little scar on your face. Oh, dirty slut! Now, kid! Most unladylike. I love the pub life. Uh, it harked a little bit for me towards what was going to happen later when they filmed um, because she's played barmaids a few times, and she was a barmaid in It Always Rains on Sunday as well, but an up-to-date one, sort of, you know, 1946, 47 one. Uh, 
and, and in fact, some of the people were the same as well. John Carroll is, is in that as well. And I think there was a freedom in the bar scenes. There was something a little bit more kind of, um, I don't know, visceral and fun. <laughs> What a pleasant surprise, Mrs. Webster. You've never been here before, have you? <laughs> no. Good evening, Dan. Good evening. You ought to have brought Mrs. Webster here before, Dan. I I'm sorry to hear your husband's poorly, Mrs. Bond. Oh, he's not poorly, Mrs. Webster. I'm afraid he's on the drink. Though I must say, I wouldn't be surprised if he wasn't working up for a nasty illness. I haven't liked the looks of him lately. He's sort of tired and puffy about the eyes. The door's still locked? Yes. He's locked himself in. He's never done that before. I can hear him shouting to himself all night. It's ever so upsetting. Perhaps you see him pink elephants. Now, there's no need to be unkind about Joe. He may drink, but there are a lot of worse things than that. Are you having a drink, Pearl? No, thanks. I'm just off to bed. Another port, Mrs. W. Well, really, I, I don't know if I should. A port and a whiskey, Maudie. Right. On the house, Maudie. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good night, Mrs. Webster. Do hope we shall see you here again soon. Good night. There's one thing about, I don't know if many people know, but when she read the script and was talking about it, um, Robert Hamer said, and you do know we'll be shooting the very last scene first. <laughs> so she actually shot her death scene before her life had begun in the film. strings and ceiling wax. Uh, my mother was immediately asked to come back and do a, a film called The Loves of Joanna Godden. Uh, that was actually the screenplay amazingly was H.E. Bates. That was something about Ealing. Ealing always brought together the most extraordinary people. Vaughan Williams did the music for The Loves of Joanna Godden. You know, the, the, we're talking about serious composers and what, uh, John Piper. He was one of the artists that did those marvellous um, posters and things, you know. Ealing really brought together very talented people in different fields. Anyway, my mother was asked to do this, um, this film. And as I said, she'd had a lot of experience, really. My father had trained over here at RADA, but he was Australian and he'd been back in Australia fighting the war um, over there. And so he came back to England to further his career. And he thought he would continue on stage where he'd started. He'd started at the Shakespeare Company. In fact, he was there when war was declared. Uh, but to his great surprise, he was suddenly, his agent said, well, we're sending you up for a couple of films. And he uh, made one film with Phillips Calvert. And then he was asked to do The Loves of Joanna Gordon. And uh, my mother had never heard of him. <laughs> And so it was, it, was a, it was a meeting where she was vastly experienced. My father, I think, had two or three films on his belt. So he was a little bit nervous. He knew exactly who she was. He'd seen her. He'd seen her actually in the jungle when he was fighting uh, up in New Guinea. They used to have big screens and they'd, they'd show old films or new films, really. And uh, Daddy had uh, seen her in something called One, our, one of Our Aircraft is Missing which Michael Powell directed. And he remembers everybody sort of in the new unit going, whoa, she'll do. <laughs> so he was pacing around, waiting to meet his uh, co-star. And uh, he wrote very vividly and sweetly about it in his memoir. He said, you know, he remembers her coming down a staircase, vital and quick stepped, which she is and was. I mean, she had such energy. And he said, you know, little did I know that she was coming into my life, and they were together for 63 years. It's all right. It's me. Tommy. Tommy. You've got to help me, Rosie. 
I'm on the run. I know. I've seen the paper. Oh, you shouldn't have come here. I've been on the run for 12 hours. I died up somewhere till dark. You're soaking. You'll catch a death of cold. I'll be all right if I get some grub. I haven't eaten since dinner time yesterday. I'll try. There are four of them inside. I'll have to wait until they've all gone out. Just some grub, Rosie. That's all I want. I've got to go back in. They'll be wondering. I'll come back as soon as they've all gone out. Clumsy little fool, those pets cost money. And don't scowl at me. It wasn't scowling. That's right, call me a liar. Yeah, what's up? Why don't you keep your kids in order? You sit there listening to her calling me a liar and you don't say a blinking word. Sounds to me as if we both want a dose of salts. Good hiding, that's what she wants. I think my mother's greatest strength as an actress was that she didn't play for sentimentality at all. She was very straightforward. She was very bold. She could be very funny, but really the films we're talking about today, they showed more her kind of feistiness, her boldness, her brazenness. Um, she, she wasn't a typical English rose. And indeed, I mean, she, her mother was Dutch and French with a smattering of German. So there's a sort of continental thing a bit with my mother. And uh, she never suffered fools gladly. But as I said, she was very funny and had a sense of humor. And yet underneath all of that, there was an enormous vulnerability. So she brought all of that to the screen. You do see that she was used as the strong woman in those Ealing films. But when my husband and I presented her with as many films as we possibly could find that she'd made, including quota quickie ones, I mean, funny, with Will Hay and all sorts of things, she hardly looked at them because she always looked forward and she very rarely looked back. She looked back with affection because she had a lot of friends. They had a lot of friends from Ealing days. Anthony Kimmins, Trouble Brewing, when George Formby, he remained a huge friend. He directed that. Charles Friend was an enormous friend. Monia Damaszewski, and he was the publicist for Ealing, oh, was one of their very best friends. He wrote a wonderful book about his life, really, but it encompassed a few things about Ealing as well. And uh, he described working there. He said, you know, the liveliness around the table when they were all discussing what they were going to do, how Michael Ball can put his trust in people. He said, you know, I came in as a publicist and I ended up being a producer of Whiskey Galore. So he did, he gave chances to people. And uh, the discussions would start. Mummy said, oh, it was wonderful. We were surrounded by very talented, very gifted and um, very active chaps who would be talking and the word games were absolutely marvellous and then they'd all go to the Red Lion and that would continue, which is the pub across the green, until they were sort of drunken, exactly the same sort of things going on. And Michael Balkan was quite a stickler. He didn't really like that, but he was very proud, I think, of his team. She, she worked at both the theatre and film. She worked until she was 85. She was on stage at the Haymarket here in London, the Theatre Royal, and she got all the notices. You know, she um, adored working, working. She was a team player. She was never grand. She knew everybody's name. Um, in fact, I was brought up in Australia because my father eventually was offered a job out there, and it was a terrific one. It was to run a string of theatres across Australia and New Zealand. And he introduced the ballet over there and opera and uh, all the musicals and Shakespeare and all sorts of things. So there was, that, that was all happening there. But I decided to come back when I'd finished school. And um, my mother took me to Pinewood. I didn't, alas, go to Ealing, but she took me to Pinewood. And we went out on a sound stage in a Bond film, and I can't remember which one was being made. So it was 1971 about that time. And. Uh, 
someone upstairs who said, oh, look, it's Googie. And she looked up and they came down from the top and she said, after all these years, Fred, George, wonderful to see. She knew them, she knew their names. So I think that, you know, says an awful lot about her, really.